Hey, welcome here to Pathway. I'm Matt Holloway, if you don't know who I am. I'm the worship pastor, assistant pastor here at Pathway. And uh, this is my wife right here, because she wants to be in the spotlight, so there she is. And um, yes, but hey, today we are going to finish up this series called You Asked For It. And so we've been in this series all of September, okay, the whole month, and so there's four other weeks four other Sundays in September. And if you missed any of those, I just wanna encourage you, go back, um, check those out, watch those online. Um, we talked about heaven, um, talked about the Old Testament and its relevance today, uh, talked about uh, sharing our faith with others. Um, we talked about how do we know the Bible's true. I mean, just some really great topics that you guys um, brought up. And um, if you didn't know, you're like, hey, when did, when did we bring these up? We actually asked these back at Easter time, so you may not remember. Um, and then we kind of compiled a list um, of what you guys had put out there. And so today, we're finishing this up with a message called, I want to change, but I don't know how. Why don't you turn your Bibles to Romans. We're gonna go to Romans chapter seven. And as you turn there, you know, there's this song that um, I really like called Ready for Change, okay? And um, the lyrics go um, something like this. It says, the things that I lost come back here the same. I thought that I'd pass them, but they found me again. It says, I woke up today and I'm still sitting here. It's just like the last one and the others before them. So yeah, I promised I'd change about this time last year, but we both know how that went. I guess you're not so important. I'm ready for change. It says, and so what does it take to start over again, to step out of comfort, my friends? Yes, and change for the better. And so why do I wait and sit here till the end, wait till it's over, and then wish I had done better? I'm ready for change. How many could relate to that song a little bit? Yeah, this is a struggle. Uh, this is talking about an inner struggle for change and not seeing it happening. You know, wanting to change and not seeing it happening. And it's very similar to what's happening here in Romans chapter seven. So if you look at Romans seven, Verse 14 through 24 is what we're gonna look at here. And this is Paul writing, and he has a very similar um, confession here. So verse 14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse 18 says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what... I do not want, it is no longer I who did it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Almost the idea of like it's just waiting, hiding, ready to pounce. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my very members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my mem members, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Man, how many can relate to that? <laughs> I mean, how many, seriously, think about it. That could be like a diary entry for all of us, right? If you had a diary, I don't, <laughs> I promise. No, I don't, but because I just don't remember to write stuff down. But, but I mean, all of us really at some point in our life could have written something like that. It's like, why do I do this thing I don't wanna do? And I, instead of doing the things I want to do, I do the thing I, I, the very thing I hate. I hate, you know, something about yourself that you're like, man, I just hate that I always do this. I always um, run into this, whatever. Maybe it's a temptation of yours that you struggle with, or maybe it's just something else. Maybe it's not necessarily something that is, um, you know, sin and not sin, you know, necessarily, but it's something that you've allowed to master you. In that, in that sense, it would be sin, but, but is something that you're like, man, I've always wanted to quit smoking. I've always wanted to stop doing that, but I just can't. I can never do that. Or maybe it's a sin struggle. And there's some time where, where Paul connects with all of us here. We've all been there. 
Um, and, and, and he basically hits the exact topic of, I want to change, but I just don't know how. It's like, I, I know what's right. It's not effective. I don't know what to do. I just can't seem to carry it out. How many of you have been there before? Raise your hand. Go ahead. Be honest. Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, you're either lying, okay, or you fell asleep. So everybody do this real quick. Just do that. Just do this to your neighbor. Good. They're all awake now. All right. Um, but the truth is we all have things about ourselves that we want to change, okay? We all have things about ourselves that we want to change at one point or another. Maybe it's something you really struggle with now. Uh, maybe you've dealt with this in the past, or maybe it's something that you're like, it just keeps recurring. It's that thing of even, as I read a moment ago, it talks about, you mean, I thought I'd passed, I thought they were in the past, and then all of a sudden it comes back around again. And a lot of us have dealt with that. I know I have. And so um, whatever it is, how do we change? How can I change? And, and, and in, in essence, you see Paul here writing, you're like, well, is change even possible? Because this is Paul the apostle, you know, the guy who planted all those churches. This is the book of Romans, which is one of his last um, things he wrote. It's definitely one of his last epistles that he wrote, meaning like a, a letter to a church um, in a, a city, the churches of a city. Um, and so this is like advanced in his life, okay? Really great stuff of him understanding, you know, scripture and, and, and connecting Jesus to the Old Testament, all sorts of great stuff in Romans. And then there's this, where he's like, and I still do what I hate. Why is that? Okay, is it possible? Well, one of the things, and just when you read scripture, always remember, you know, the, the chapters and the verses in there, they're really helpful. And they were done at some point several hundred years ago by some monks. Um, and they, you know, put them all in there. And it's, it's helpful because we're like, hey, turn to Romans 7, like, because it's a long letter. And so we can turn there. But they weren't originally written like that. So sometimes it's like, hey, Keep reading, keep reading, and you might um, find out some more. And so um, let's go back to, to Romans 7, 24, and we're going to read into chapter 8 as well and see what Paul continues on with this. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the, the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Okay, and it's gonna get kind of meaty and confusing for a second, but then it's gonna, it's gonna come back around and make sense. So, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Got all that? A little deep, okay? <laughs> Let's just say, but like for those of us that walk according to the spirit, talking about what Jesus came to do. Verse five, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds, okay, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to God, for it does not to sit, submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. In, um, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your, or give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Okay. Sick. It gets a little confusing. Sometimes we get in those deep sections where we're like, I don't know, I'm going to skip this. You know, it's like, just wait a second. And he starts to get there. And really, how do we change? How would Paul say we change? There's one thing. It's the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. You and I need the power of the Holy Spirit to change. You can fill that in in your notes. You and I need the power of the Holy Spirit to change. Okay? What I'm saying is, this is not a self-help talk today. Okay? Okay? When we get into this subject of like, I wanna change, but I don't know how, and all right, I got my pen, and you're gonna tell me how to do it. This is not a self-help talk, okay? 
we are in a culture that loves to be like, hey, if you do this and this and this, and you post a picture on social media, you're good. You know what I mean? Like, that's how it works. They're like, you dig down deep in there somewhere. It's there, girl, you know? <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it seems like girls say that more often, but <laughs> listen, this is not a self-help talk, okay? Because you and I, we're not strong enough. We're not good enough. We've been there, done that, right? All of us said we could write that. Paul writes that, but he says, if you're, it, it, he's like, you're not strong enough, but thanks be to God for, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? That's what, that's the difference. He says, that's the difference in his life. He's really kind of, whether he's dealing with something right in that moment or not, he's relating to all of us and saying, we've all been here, but remember the Holy Spirit makes the difference. Okay, and so if you don't hear anything else today, I hope you keep listening. Please don't fall asleep. Remember this move, okay? Help your neighbors, all right? But if you don't hear anything else, hear this. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to change, whatever it is. And we're talking sin and, and, and righteousness. You're like, of course I need that. I'm talking anything in your life, anything that you want to change and you're struggling to do, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to go to God and tap into the power of the Holy Spirit to make that happen. That's the only way we will really get there. And that's because of this battle that's going on, okay? So one of the most important things for us to understand um, about this and why it's like, oh, it's that simple. You know, because sometimes it's like, I, look, I'm gonna give you some practical thoughts, okay? But I want you to understand, this is not just a self-help talk. You do these things and it's a formula, okay? And it's also not, I'm not gonna say on the other end that it's like, hey, you just like go to the feeder bar of, of the Holy Spirit. And you're like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Because some are like, well, I've prayed and I didn't really... But it's, it's really understanding more than just saying, I need to ask God, because that is what we need to do. Absolutely, we need to go to God. But more than that, we need to understand the battle that's happening inside of all of us, okay? Um, and so if you would, turn to Galatians. If you want to leave, um, you know, the little thingy, dingleberry thing, whatever it is, in the, into the Romans, then you can uh, move that. Sorry, I call my kids that all the time, so it just slips out. And if you knew my kids, then, then enough said, Okay. I would say that, but okay, Galatians, all right? I should have turned here earlier and then I wouldn't have to find it with you. Okay, okay, there it is. Galatians chapter five. Um, we're gonna look at 16 and 17, okay? Because the truth is there's actually um, this, this fight that's happening in us and really the flesh actually fights the spirit of God in us. And I want you to understand this. Okay, 16, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. It's the same, same, same thing, same idea that he's talking about in Romans 8 when he says you wanna do something but you can't and you just feel like you can't, can't do it. And here he says it's because of that battle and the flesh fights against the spirit of God in you so that you won't do what you want to do, okay? And, and that is what keeps you from doing it. So if, 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 to answer the question of even like, well, why, why can't I do what I want to do? It's because there's that battle going on. And, and, and why I point that out is like, you're like, yeah, they're different, I get it. No, it's more than that, they're just different. Like, yeah, the spirit and my flesh, they're different. They're just, they're just different. They're each their own thing, you know? And like, we kind of live in that culture too, you know? Where it's like, it's okay. You know, it's like, no. It literally uses the word um, conflict in some, in, in some translations. Or it uses this idea that they fight against one another, contrary to one another. Romans 8 that we just read, 7 and 8, says this. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It's hostile towards God, okay? And, and in, um, in that passage we just read, it even uses the word war. There's a war happening inside of all of us, okay? So don't just think like, okay, it, there's, a, there's a different, there's one side of me and then there's the other side and you need to choose the good side. It's like, no, they're fighting against each other. And when there's a battle, there's usually a winner, Right? I mean, there's a struggle and it's tough and it goes on and then the one is trying to conquer the other and the other's trying to either prevent that or conquer the other back, okay? And so that's what's happening. And it uses words like war and conflict because you gotta understand this is something that is a, a, a battle that's happening inside of you, not just two sides of you that you need to choose the correct one, 
okay? But, but Galatians 18, uh, uh, 5, verse 18 says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorce- sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And one thing I just want to explain in that is that is just basically listing every category of sin, like multiple things in every kind of category of sin. Um, And so um, I'm not gonna get into all that right now. So this is not an exhaustive list. He's just saying all these types of things, all these types of things is when the work are the works of the flesh, okay? The works of the flesh. And then um, where are we at here? But uh, yeah, 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live um, by the spirit, let us also keep in step with the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay, how many of you ever heard of the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Okay, what I want you to understand is that's the context of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is this conversation about the, two, the battle that's happening inside of you, okay? The two sides that are fighting against each other, and that's the, those are the product of one or the other, okay? That's what the whole idea of fruit, okay? It has nothing to do with apples and oranges and all those things, okay? It has to do with a product, like a tree grows fruit, it produces those, those things that we eat or whatever. In this case, he's saying, these are the products. And the works of the flesh is how it says it here. It could say the fruit of the flesh. It doesn't matter. The idea that when we have our mind set on things of the flesh, it says this is what's gonna come of it. All the sin, all the bad stuff, all the things that keep you doing from what you really want to do, it's coming out of having a mind set on flesh and that's the product of that. And living that out and following that instead of having a mind set on the spirit. And we live that and we follow that and therefore we produce Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And all those things are really get us to where we said, that's the things I want to do, right? And especially in this case, self-control is probably a really big one, right? And maybe goodness would be another one because doing what's good instead of what's evil, right? Is that sometimes the, the part we talked about, I wanna change, or maybe it's this self-control, something that you've allowed to master you. Um, and you're like, I, I want to have the self-control to do that. It says that's a product that comes out of a mind set on, um, on the spirit, okay? So the bad news is this, okay? The bad news is that you're not good enough, okay? I've came here today to tell you you're not good, okay? <laughs> okay, I'm just telling you. When it comes to change, though, it's like you're not strong enough. That's the bad news, okay? But Romans 8 9, okay, um, says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, and if in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, okay? And it says, if those who are in Christ Jesus, it says the spirit of God dwells in us. So the good news is this, guys, is we do though, we are not people of the flesh if we are under Christ Jesus our Lord, okay? We're people of the spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in us, okay? It's called the spirit of Christ in Romans chapter eight. And the great news is this. There's good, there's, see, there's bad news and there's good news. Now there's great news, okay? Great news is this. It says the Holy Spirit dwells in you, okay? It says it dwells in you. It's not your flesh. It isn't necessarily that case, but it dwells in you. And so when it says like this thing of like, oh, if I need the Holy Spirit to change, the great news is it's inside of you, it is. And so I know the idea, I said, hey, you said if you dig deep, you know, I'm talking when we dig deep into us, but if we tap into the Holy Spirit that is in us, if we set our mind on the Holy Spirit and its power, then we can, we can change, okay? And we're not strong enough. We need the Holy Spirit's strength. And the great news is, if we're in Christ Jesus, it dwells inside of us. If you're here this morning, you're like, man, I haven't really given my life to Christ. I'm just not there yet. Listen, you're gonna, you're gonna go through those motions constantly, and you're gonna grind those gears constantly. And you, if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, you're not gonna change. Because that's what makes us transform, okay? That's what trans- transforms us. And so the main thought I really wanted to, to, to hit you guys with this morning is understand the battle. And what that means is you have to understand that your flesh is corrupt, 
okay? Um, it continues to be that way. And so there's not a point where like, won't I be good enough at some point? No, you won't. But the spirit of God in you is strong enough and will be strong enough and will be good enough. And that should continue to grow in our life to where we can. And so the question is like, well, how can we, how can we choose that? Because you say the mindset on the spirit instead of the mindset on the flesh, okay? And so I'm gonna give you some practical thoughts. This is not like an all-encompassing thing, but just some practical thoughts on what can I do? What can I do to, to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit? What can I do? What part can I play? Because again, I don't, I don't wanna leave you with like, hey, it's the Holy Spirit, good luck. You know, like don't do anything, don't change anything, and just see what works, okay? So there are some things we can do to position ourselves, okay, to, um, the, for the power of the Holy Spirit to change us. Okay, first thing, is this, submit your life to Christ, okay? Submit your life to Christ, all right? And meaning make him the Lord of your life, okay? And if you're, like I said, if you're in here and you're like, man, I'm not really following Jesus, I wouldn't call him that, then you need to do that, okay? That's, and that's the moment we, that the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit comes into us, okay? That's the initial. Then we have a second working of the Holy Spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We receive power to be witnesses, okay? And that's also part of this as well, okay? Seeking more and more of the Holy Spirit, okay? But um, you, you have to do that. But I'm not just, I don't just mean get saved, okay? <laughs> like when you're like submit, because some of us might write that down and be like, check, done. You know, like um, when I was 10, I, you know, got saved and so I'm good. I'm, but I mean, submit your life to Christ, meaning give your life, your entire life to him, every area of your life, in submission to God. Because sometimes when there's something about our life that we want to change, is that area is maybe not in submission to God as much as it is to us, right? Because we want to hold on to certain things, okay? We make excuses because we're human beings. That's what we do. You can read through the Gospels, and there's times where he, Jesus said, come and follow me, and got people like, yeah, I will, but first... I need to go do this. And so don't, don't wait for me. I'll be there though. You know, like that kind of a thing is kind of the thought like there. And it was, kind of, it was, it wasn't just uh, when we do the same thing, right? When, when we want to change something, we're like, well, but I really don't want to lose this or I'm not sure how this is going to work. And so, um, and we don't fully submit those things to God. And so this is something for all of us to continually do in greater ways is continue to submit my life to Christ. Be humble before God, be realistic with what you struggle with. Be open to, with God of what you're dealing with instead of denying it, because guess what? He already knows, right? Like he's aware, he was there. You know what I mean? Like you didn't, you didn't hide anything from him. So being humble to say, God, I need you. God, I don't see you reigning in this area of my life, okay? Because I, I need a mindset on the spirit instead of the fleshly things. And so, and this is something that is deliberate and it's intentional, okay? Otherwise, that waging war inside of us um, is gonna cause a split in submission because that's kind of what it does, all right? James 4, 8 in the New Living Translation says this, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Man, I love the way that puts that. A lot of translations, it says double-minded, which means the same thing. But for us, sometimes we don't quite make the connection outside. It's like, because your loyalty is divided between God and the world. And he's saying, you need to come back to God being the one you're loyal to. I love the way that puts it. It's very similar to the way Jesus put it in Matthew chapter six. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, okay? And the context here is he's teaching on treasures, okay? And saying, don't, you know, uh, and, and like where your um, treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that whole teaching is in here in Matthew 6. And so that's why he says you cannot serve both God and money. He's making that. But honestly, the principle there, because of before, he just said you can't serve two masters, period, is in general. You will love one, hate the other, love one, despise the other. Um, it doesn't work. You cannot serve both God and Fill in the blank. Because the context, like I said, the context here was treasures, money, okay, possessions. But this principle applies to all, th- all things, really. All things that would compete with God being the Lord of your life or this thing being. And says, he, he said, in general, you cannot serve two masters. It just doesn't work. Because, because one will end up winning. 
okay? It's the same thing that we just talked about, the battle that's happening inside of you, okay? And so you cannot serve that. So what is it for you? Maybe there's something in your life, you're in an area, you're like, you know what? I'm trying to serve both God and what? What is it? What are the, sometimes that's the thing that was like, man, I'm trying to change, I'm trying to change, but because I'm trying to serve two different things at once, I'm never going to be able to change because I'm gonna be split. My loyalties are split. This battle is gonna continue to tear me apart. It just doesn't work like that, okay? And remember, the Holy Spirit is the key to change in our lives, okay? So we need to be led by the Spirit, which means that God needs to be calling the shots, means the Holy Spirit needs to be our guide, okay? And so that, so humility before God is everything in this. We need to be humble, okay? I was just talking about a verse earlier, joking around with some, some of the team is like, the Bible says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but with sober judgment, okay, with the measure uh, of faith, um, according to the measure of faith that God has given you. It's this idea of just being honest with God, knowing where are my weaknesses, where are my strength? God, help me with this. Where am I? Because guess what? You're not perfect. Ask your spouse. Just kidding. Hopefully they say great things about you all the time. And so maybe ask someone else. No, I don't know. But you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And I've got to be willing to say, God, there's some areas that even, um, even as I try to serve you and minister or do whatever, it's like there might be areas that I say, I don't know if I'm really allowing God to be the master of that. I think something else. I'm really serving something else, something fleshly, something that is going to lead to other things, okay? So submit your life to Christ, okay? Second thing is this. Make a break. Make a break. These next two are what, even more practical, okay? Make a break. Okay, break up, dump him, all right? <laughs> Kick him out, you know, get him out of there. This is like, it, drop them like a bad habit because they are one, right? <laughs> like, um, and this, this could be people, it could be other things, um, even when it talks to relationships, um, whatever. Se- 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 17, through 17 says this, do not be yoked together with unbelievers, For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, which is another word for like Satan, that kind of thing. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the the temple of the living God. Okay, that's why I talk about the spirit dwells in us, okay? And God said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people, okay? Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And this is, this is um, Paul um, even quoting the Old Testament here, okay? So going back to that thing, is it relevant? He said, hey, this part is, okay? And he says, he says, um, he says do not be yoked together. And that is an old school term, okay? Um, that is, has nothing to do with eggs. If you're hungry right now, I'm sorry, Okay? Um, that is um, a piece of wood, okay, that would, would it, like um, harness together. It's like a harness, essentially, but it would be a, a, a solid piece of wood and you would yoke together um, two oxen to plow the field, okay? And it kind of relates back to, um, there's an old, and I won't go there, but there's an Old Testament law when we talk about laws and they really represented something in the New Testament, right, or, or something greater. And there was a law where you couldn't um, yoke together an oxen and a donkey, which you would have never done because it doesn't make it, you know what I mean? You have this big, strong oxen and this little donkey and you would have been going in circles. You know what I mean? And so like, it was a law. It was like a, it was a civil law. Like you were not allowed to do that. Why? Because, fast forward, or even then, this whole idea of trying to be pure, don't be like the other nations. Israel, you're my holy nation, right? And he says, now we're the kingdom of God. And he says, don't be yoked together with an unbeliever. Just like you wouldn't take an ox and a donkey and put them together is don't be yoked together, don't be tied together because you guys are not gonna be able to go the same direction, okay? Because one's gonna drag you down and off to the other side. And so that's why we use this a lot in relationships. That's exactly what it's talking about. So like, don't be, uh, like if you're dating someone, okay, that is not a follower of Christ, that's dumb, okay? (laughs) That's super dumb, all right? So all my years of youth pastoring coming out right now, okay? It's like bottom line of boundary. So that like, if, if you're dating someone that's pulling you away from Jesus, get rid of them, okay? Now, if you're married, that's a different story, okay? You made a covenant before God, okay? So if you think that Pastor Matt is telling you to get divorced, you're wrong because the Bible says not to, okay? Um, God has joined you together and there's a whole different 
thing of, of seeking the Lord together, okay? Um, but if there's, or maybe it's not a dating relationship, it's a friendship. Maybe there's a friendship in your life or a friend group that is dragging you away from God. Make a break, break up with them. Have the breakup talk with your bros too. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you have to make a break. You have to s- separate some things, okay? This includes relationships. 1 Corinthians 15, says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I'm just gonna reach him for Jesus though. No, you're not. Bad company corrupts good character. And you're like, well, Jason just talked about sharing your faith with people. Yeah, and we, we can talk about Matthew um, in the New Testament, you know, throwing parties for his old tax collector friends. And they were, yeah, and guess who was there with him? Jesus. <laughs> who else? The other disciples. Like his new core and his new friends were there. And that's when, when Jesus went to sinners, like Jesus went to sinners' houses. Yeah, with his bros, like with the guys. And, and one thing, you're not Jesus, okay? It's okay, I know we're supposed to be like Jesus, but the other note is like, he went there with the group and he, he was like, let's go to their house. And you had all this accountability. And so maybe you have, a friend, you have friend groups that are like, damn, that, there's nobody else there. And we just, I'm gonna reach him for Jesus. No, you're not, because don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Make a break. Now, if it's not a relationship thing, it's not a friendship or whatever, that is. This principle still applies because he talks about don't be yoked together with an unbeliever, but then he just goes in this whole thing of what fellowship do light have with darkness, righteousness with wickedness. All these things is like, as, as you being righteous, have, you're, the, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, and even in that, con- there's another context when he talks about us being the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, he says don't, then therefore, don't, don't, if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, don't, don't unite your body with a prostitute. Saying that doesn't make any sense. We're talking about sexual sin there. But either way, it's this idea that if you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, okay, there should be a separation between the righteousness that's in you and the world, Okay, and that doesn't mean that we don't love people and try to reach them for Jesus, but it does mean that we have to be careful and know that when, when we're struggling with bad habits and things, there's gotta be a point where we make a break and say, I gotta separate myself. And this may be, like I said, this may be with relationships and those things. It might just be with whatever it is, practically speaking, that you're struggling with, whatever, uh, maybe it's a device, maybe something that you're looking at, you're in a computer, whatever it is. There's gotta be a point where you do something that, that draws a line, that makes it a little harder to cross that. Okay, distance is good with that. That's the same way, if relationship, break up with them, all right? Be done with it. Um, separate yourself from that, and especially at this point in your life, okay, because you're struggling. Um, or maybe it's something, let's say, you're looking at, or um, it could be a number of things, the way you act a um, certain way, the way you talk um, in a certain way. It's like you need to make a separation of something that is feeding into that. Okay, so maybe it's uh, for your computer or something. It's like it's a, uh, your devices. It's a it's a, f- a filter. It's accountability software. Something that um, that makes this separation, makes a break between you and that thing. Maybe it's you're not going to watch this or that show anymore. You got it. You're going to cancel cable. You're going to do something that's like because the idea of like I'm not going to do it is like. Well, that's, again, that's the problem. You know, like we got to was, I said, this is what I want to do, but I can never seem to follow through. So something that makes an actual break. It's like, I gotta cancel cable for a while. I can't do that. I gotta, um, I gotta do what, whatever it is. Maybe it's um, not going to a certain place anymore. It's like, I can't even be there because that's where I struggle. Like, okay, it's that this whole idea of, somebody just mentioned the other week, like if you struggle with um, alcohol, like the bar is not the place you should go, right? You gotta make a break from that, okay? If you're struggling with sexual sin, we gotta make a break from the things that, that do that. Jesus talked about it in his Sermon on the Mount when he said, man, cut off your right hand if it caused you to sin, okay? Saying it would be better to do that. And the point was, you gotta make a break, okay? Don't go maiming yourself. That was his point, okay? Uh, I should probably explain that, all right? But the point was, you gotta make a break. Whatever's causing you to sin, make a break from it. So whatever it is, maybe it's what? What is the thing that you're like, you know what? I need to t- make a break right now. I need to separate. I need to come out from among them and be separate from them, okay? Because you're righteous, the Holy Spirit's in you, and that thing is darkness fighting it, okay? Regardless of what it is, make a break, okay? Last thing is this, fill the void, okay? Fill the void, okay? And this goes right along with the last one, If you're gonna make a break, okay, if you're gonna separate yourself, you're basically gonna create some space, something you're doing in your life right now that you're gonna stop doing, okay? You need to fill that space, okay? Take some things out of your life, fill the void, 
with things of God, okay? Things that are gonna lead you um, that way, okay? One of my favorite parts of Galatians 5 um, that we read was that when we, uh, verse, verse 25, it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit, I love that. I love that thought because we have this idea of setting your mind on Christ, right? Um, walking by the Spirit. And in your life, you're talking about what does it really look like to walk, walk in the Spirit? But, um, but even that idea says if, if we live by the Spirit, if that's where we want to live, then it says keep in step. The idea I get is like keep up, you know, like, um, you know, like soldiers marching and they, their steps are all together, right? Is this idea of like you need to keep in step with what the Holy Spirit is doing. And so don't, and you feel like I'm falling behind. And some of that is like, we need, to, we need to be doing things that are keeping our spirit alive in us, okay? And this is really, the idea of submitting yourself to Christ would kind of go in here too. So if you're like, you know, this idea of how can I submit my life more to Christ, that's kind of a filling the void, of course, as well. But, um, but the idea, don't, don't fall behind. Keep in sync with the spirit um, and, and so that's, sometimes that's simpler than we think. Cause I, I mean, yes, that involves, um, connecting with God more regularly through prayer and, and being people of the word, being people in the word of God and, and knowing God's word. But sometimes I just be honest, you know, the thing of like, I'm going to stop sinning. And instead when, and when I would normally do that, I'm going to pray and read my Bible. Like, and it works every time. Just kidding. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, I, I, sometimes what I mean is though, position yourself. It's not just that, because again, if it was just back to willpower, then it's like, well, instead of doing that, I'm gonna read my Bible. It's like, that's, sometimes that's leaning on willpower. I'm not saying don't read your Bible. I'm saying um, do other things to that position you that is gonna be feeding your spirit and keeping you in a place. Sometimes it's as simple as show up to church, okay? Consistently, sorry, let me add that in there consistently, all right? I mean, I just heard a pastor say the other day, what, what would it be like if you showed up to church for 52 Sundays a year, okay? That's all of them, by the way, in case you didn't know, okay? 52 weeks a year, that's a rough estimate, could be more or less depending on how the weeks go, but usually 52, okay? What would happen, okay? I mean, think about it. at least once a week, you're really being fed by the, you know, by, by um, the leadership and by the, uh, hearing the word of God and really setting that tone. Now, I'm not, I'm not condemning if you go on vacation. That's not, but the point was just think about if you just showed up consistently, be there, um, get in a life group, okay? Get in a life group, a small group of people that meet together and connect with, their, and they're not the, you know, hopefully, they're not the bad company that corrupts their good character, right? All right? I know most of our life group leaders and they're pretty good people, most of them. All right? No, I'm just kidding. They all are. Okay, and so the idea, and literally that point, like when we're saying fill the void, is like I, I got to get rid of these friends and do this. And sometimes that one's the, one of the hardest because we're like, well, I don't want to lose these people. I don't want to lose this, and that's why I'm saying we make those excuses um, for ourselves because like I don't, I don't know if I can make that break because I don't have anyone else. Well, we've got to get someone else. Like we've got to get people that are, are again, we got to get the bros. We got to get the the group that that is going the same direction. The disciples, the the the, the core, okay. And that's that's the main goal. You know, there's we have several different types of life groups here. I mean, one's about parenting, getting better at that, and um, you know, financial peace or whatever it might be. You know, different things. Um, and there's ones that just you know, look at the uh, message notes and study deeper into those. There's ones that do other studies, but the the, the that and that's great. We want you to grow deeper. But what's going to really make you grow deeper is the fact that you have other people along that journey with you. Okay, that's the point of being in a life group is people that you connect with, people that can say, Hi, hey, how are you doing in that? Okay, and, and, and those friends that will do that. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A quarter of three strands is not going to be broken. And I love the part that says that one may be overpowered. We're just talking about being overpowered in the battle, right? It's like, but two people, it's harder, okay? And so find those people. Get in a life group. Connect with people that are going the same direction that can help you from being overpowered in those things. And another thing would just be serve others. Serve in the church. Serve outside of the church, but, but serve 
for God's purposes. First Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I'm gonna read that again. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. God has given you all gifts and things that I mean, you're good at. Um, or maybe, maybe it's just a personality thing that is we great for this or that. Use those things. Serve, serve one another in the church because that's, that's our purpose is to serve others, okay? Lining ourselves up with things that will do, make us better at loving God and loving people, right? And that's what, so serve others. Get, get, get a life group, show up to church, those things. Be someone who's in the word. Figure out a way to get the word of God in your life more. Maybe it is your Bible app going off every morning or whatever it is and reading those things. Get, get more of God in you. And I know some of you might think, like, hey, as I preach this message, do I get like a bonus if I mention life groups and showing up to service? And I have yet to get one, okay? Um, I've been waiting. But no, guys, and sometimes when we mention these things, you're like, well, you're just trying to boost your numbers, aren't you? Like, I don't care. Like, listen, the reason we do those things is for the exact purpose of helping you grow as followers of Christ. Like, our call is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, right? And the Bible calls you saints, I know, Right? calls us all saints, okay? It's not talking about the Catholic saints. It's talking about you, okay? Bible, God thinks you're a saint because of Jesus Christ in you. How awesome is that? Okay, but listen, it says to equip them. And then our, our call of all of us is to make more disciples, right? Is be great, better disciples so we can make more disciples. And so that's why we do these things. Do what you need to do to fill the void in your life. Sometimes we get our are you know, kind of on like the exercise bike, not going anywhere type thing. And it's because we need to be serving with purpose. Some of you have gifts and you're not using them in the church. Do that because God has given that so that we can advance the kingdom. Some of you are not using that to serve others outside of the church. You're not, um, some of you, um, well, all of us have something to give to someone else. And we need to do that in a life group, okay? And we have, we need people with us to, 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 to be more like Christ. So separate yourself from those things, make a break, but then fill that void, okay? Fill that void, get more plugged in um, with God because that's gonna position you for that. But ultimately remember, the Holy Spirit, okay? It's the Holy Spirit, it's the idea that I wanna set my mind on the Spirit of God instead of the things of the flesh, okay? Because I need the power of the Holy Spirit to change. You know, it's just a few weeks back, I was, um, I actually knew I was preaching on this already. And just to let you know, this is a really fun subject to preach on because you feel horrible about yourself. Okay, <laughs> just gonna be honest. Like you, you know, it's like, I'm gonna tell you how to change because I'm awesome at it. Like, no, it's like, I, I could have written Romans 7 too. I mean, I, it's just totally, I'm totally there, okay? And a few weeks back, I just had a rough day, okay? One of those, like, because a lot of it, it's like this mental battle you have. Like some, some days you're just more aware of the battle, right? Just your thoughts and, um, you know, selfish things and whatever. And I just went to bed that night just really having, just having a rough day with it. And, um, you know, just felt, felt it. And, was, you know, I prayed and I was seeking after the Lord in that and um, didn't necessarily feel anything laying in bed there. Because again, I get the idea, but we've got to take it to the Lord. We've got to ask the Holy Spirit to help us change because I am not strong enough. And so I, I asked that. And here's the crazy thing. I woke up the next morning and, and I just, honestly, I woke up thinking about Christ, just, just, just like excited for what I needed to do um, to serve the kingdom, all that stuff, just woke up like that. And I know you think, well, that's how you wake up every morning as a pastor, right? No, it's not. Most of the time it's probably similar to you or like, it's morning already, are you kidding? You know what I mean? Like that's the same, same thoughts, okay? But I woke up just like, just like, bam, like instantly thinking. And in that moment, God just kind of spoke to me, not audibly, but what popped in my head was Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. It says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Man, guys, here's what, here's what I want you to understand. When we struggle with this whole, how can, I wanna change, but I don't know how. And we, look, we need the Holy Spirit to do it. We can't, we gotta lean on God. But there's a lot of things that you and I struggle with that we've given up on. And I want you to understand, God hasn't. It is never too late. The whole idea, and probably why I even had all that going on, was for God to help us understand that 
you and I don't often see things through, but God always does. And it is not too late. And whatever you're dealing with, whatever the thing is, you're like, man, I just wanna change this. I hate this. I hate that I always do this. It's like, Paul, I do the very thing I hate. And instead, guys, it's not too late. It's not too late, okay? We sometimes mark it as too late. Oh, I've just struggled with this too long. We start to make it part of our personality, right? That's just how I am. You know, that's how my family was or whatever. Guys, it's not too late, okay? His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. God is always ready for his people to come to him. And he's ready to come through for you, okay? Let's pray.